20 milestone. <laughs> I want to thank, first of all, Pastor Bill for the opportunity for, uh, to come up here this morning and share with you uh, God's Word. Um, just to have a brief, short testimony, I guess about four years ago, Wendy and I were given a Bible reading plan that we could read the whole Bible in four years. And uh, through four years, we endured through it. We just finished it just a few months ago. And, um, well, why so slow, right? But we found that when we read it slow, we learned much more for, from it. Um, I learned a lot about who God is, but also um, his love for us. His love, his mercy, his grace is through the whole thing. And we hear people say, that is just a book of rules, and it's not. It's just, it's just God's love through it. And while we, were, while we were studying it, we came across a book called Habakkuk. Now, who's going to preach on Habakkuk but me? And uh, so if, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk, it, it's in the Old Testament. It is uh, five books from the end of the Old Testament. If you have that red Bible in front of you, I know we have blue Bibles, black Bibles, red Bibles. But if you have the red Bible in front of you, it's page 493. So... I'm ashamed to say that I never th read through the Bible. I went to Christian school. Um, I read parts of the Bible. I studied it here and there, but never read through it. And once I read through it, I realized all the other books I've ever been reading in life have been pretty much a waste of time. And um, God, as we were reading through Habakkuk and studying it, he revealed to me how applicable this book is to our lives today. So I think we need to understand and enhance our understanding of the book. First of all, we need to kind of know what it's about, right? So if we look at, if we're looking back into the Old Testament, Pastor Bill had a perfect setup last week, and we never talked about what we were going to preach on. And so he had a, he had a perfect uh, setup for this. So if we look back at the Old Testament, and and we're, we're talking about negative numbers here, right? So we're going back in time. So we have zero, Christ comes. So we're going back in time. So about 975 B.C., the house of Israel split into two nations, right? Into two kingdoms. Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. So this book um, takes up around 640 B.C. At that time, King Uzziah was king, and he had, reigned in, he had reigned there for 31 years. He became king at age eight. So he was very young, and that was the thing that they did then. He was eight years old, he became king, and he was king for 31 years. In that time frame, he was a godly king. His father and his grandfather were both ungodly kings. If you're interested in reading more about, about King Uzziah, you can look back at 2 Kings 22 and 23. So, as we look at this, and it, we'll look at the king for a second, but um, when King Uzziah went to leave in that time period, the nation of Judah, now it's funny about this book, about this book um, Habakkuk never really talks about what nation he's referring to, but theologians say it's Judah. All right, so we'll assume it's Judah in, in our study here. So through our time, um, he, can, he continues... But he could, Habakkuk could see that the moral decline, the spiritual and moral decline of Judah declined. It, it just continued to decline through his time there, right? And it's a little bit like our presidents. We have presidents. We have one that have higher morals or higher values, maybe more in line with Christianity, and then we have another president that's not. So it's trans, it, through the years of kings, it transferred, right, through time. So... As we look at Habakkuk, we'll be able to see the love that he had for his people. He had an extreme love for his people through time, and it brought great anxiety to him. So, aren't we at times overwhelmed by where we are in our country today? All right, our hearts are broken over things. To think about, in 2020, there were, over, there were 615,000 abortions. Okay, 615,000 abortions in, um, in 2020. Um, it's been declared that the U.S. is not a Christian state, any co Christian country anymore. 
Sixty-one um, percent of Americans between the ages of 18 and 35 say that they don't believe in God, that God does not exist, is their, is their view of that. So as we go through life, we have also things that are personal things that disappoint us, right? We could be disappointed in things that could lead to anger, could even lead to depression, could lead to anxiety, could lead to um, being even mad at God over things. Maybe you're dealing with a health concern right now, right? You have something that's happening in the next few weeks, or you're dealing with your marriage is, is struggling, or the way your child is living today, how your child is living, a job or a lack of a job, or your finances or no finances, right? Or a health concern or any one of those other stressors. They could be something that's bearing down on you right now. So I think this book, when we look at Habakkuk, we'll see his brokenness in his heart and how he cries to God and the principles that we could learn from Habakkuk. So before, before we get into it, let's pray for a second and let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us these things. Lord, thank you so much that we could be here together. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you've brought this to us and that we can have this. Thank you for Habakkuk, the prophet, and for his word, and help us to be able to apply these things to our lives today. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's start with our main point of the whole book. Our main point of the book is the Lord desires for us to live a life of faithfulness and rejoicing in him, no matter the circumstances we face. So our main point is not for us to be happy in our Christianity and not to suffer, right? It doesn't say that. Our main point of this is that we will live a life that's faithful to him and that we will rejoice in him is where we're going with this. So no matter the circumstances, no, so no matter what our circumstances are we, faith, we face, we should be faithful to him and we should rejoice in him. So one thing that I really love about this book as we go into it is this is a book that Habakkuk wrote as a journal. This is a man's journal. So ladies, don't try to convince me that this is a, this is a diary, right? This isn't a diary. It wasn't written with some pink feather pen, and her, his name is not Habby or anything else. This is a man's journal, right, that we're going to look at here. So what is the coolest part about this book, which really intrigued me, is I have a chance to open up Habakkuk's journal and read it, right? You ladies didn't like anybody reading your diary, right? Habakkuk wrote this for the point for us to be able to read it, to understand what he wants to share with us. So our path of study is, we're going to find Habakkuk. He has two complaints. He brings two complaints to God. Have you ever brought a complaint to God? We all do. We all bring complaints to God. Lord, I don't understand this. I don't know why you're doing this. Second, we can see the Lord answers both of those prayers. And then Habakkuk goes into what the Lord shares with him. It's called five woes. Woe to this person. Woe to the unrighteous. He goes into that in chapter 2 and 3. So then it closes with chapter 3 with Habakkuk praising the Lord for what he has done. Right? So we're going to go through this. Now we only have a few minutes, but clearly we'll be able to go through this the best that we can in the few minutes that we have. So let's look at Habakkuk chapter 1. Right? And it starts off with, so our first point is to, our first point is to wait on the Lord. Our first point of understanding, I'm calling it. A point of understanding is when you experience something and you have knowledge and it comes together. So we have understanding in something. So our first point of understanding in chapter 1 is to wait on the Lord, for he is working in our lives beyond our understanding. We should wait on the Lord, right? Not to be haphazard in what we do and havoc, right, and chaos in our lives. We should wait on him because he's working in our lives beyond our understanding. So we're going to look at this. We're going to see how Habakkuk put this. First thing is in verse 1, he talks about this as an oracle, right? This is communication with God. Habakkuk was a prophet. A prophet was as if God was sitting here right before us. He's using the words that God gave him to share with others. So it says in verse 2, 
It says, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. And you will not hear? It's a question. So how long do I have to keep calling for help? How long do I keep crying for help and, and you won't hear me? That's what he's asking him. Do you ever feel that in life? I felt that many times in my life. Like, Lord, where are you? I keep calling for you. But let's look at this for a second. He doesn't understand why he's not being heard. And that's what he's bringing to the Lord. It's not his complaint. Is why are you not hearing me? Uh, do you feel like that? You're not being heard? Now look at one thing here. Look at how he's crying to the Lord. He's coming to him with love. He's coming to him with fear. He's coming to him with respect. And our lives are shaped by who we cry to. Uh, Paul David Tripp said, if you cry to people instead of God, you will ask those people to do what only God can do. Right? So here, here, here Habakkuk has it right. He goes to the Lord over it. He doesn't cry to others. Now, there's nothing wrong with sharing your prayer requests with others and, and, and your brokenness. That's fine. But cry, we need to cry to the Lord over it. So let's, let's look at um, Habakkuk's first complaint. All right, his first complaint was this. In verses 3 and 4, it says, Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you do iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, and strife and contentment arise. So the law is paralyzed, and your justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. All right, so... He's, he's looking at this and he says, he's just like us. We question God about these things, about the horrible things that we're seeing in our personal life or in other lives or in our country. And the law goes ignored. Don't we see that today? The way people run through traffic signs or whatever it is, the law just goes ignored. And it doesn't seem like justice ever, that justice prevails, right? And the injustice, it just doesn't seem like it stops. But let's look at verses 5 through 11 and see how Habakkuk answers that. And he says, look among the nations and see, wander and be astounded. Right? So, and it says, for I am doing a work in your days that you would never believe if told. Right? So, I'll have to admit that. If God came alongside of me and he said to me, Ken, this is what I'm doing in your life. This is what I'm doing in your personal life. This is what I'm doing in the life of our country. This is what I'm doing in the life of our church. I would tell him to knock it off, right? Because I would say, I don't believe you, Lord. I don't believe that because what I'm seeing is not what you're doing. And he assures us that I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I've told you, right? So when we're going through this hard times, we have to be rest assured that the Lord is working in our lives beyond our understanding. He we don't, know what he's, we don't know what he's doing in, his, in our lives, right? So as we struggle with these things of life, have you ever had a time in your life when you were out of options, right? You thought, the Lord, I don't know what you're doing in my life, but I don't know where you're going with these things, but he fixes it, and then you don't like the way he fixed it? Have you ever had that happen? Like, I didn't know, that wasn't part of this, right? But he ends up fixing it for you, so let's look at what he does next here, right? So let's, verse, let's look at verses uh, 6 through 11. So this is how the Lord answers him. It says, Behold, I am raising up Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breath of the earth, the breath of the earth, and seized dwellings, not their own. They are, so here he is. Here's the Lord's answer to him. So Judah is an evil nation, right? You can see it's declining, right? This is what the Lord's going to do. He's going to bring another nation that's even more evil than the Judeans to come to solve his problem. And you must be, he, Judah, Habakkuk must be saying, Lord, what are you doing here? Like, I have a problem here, and you're going to bring another nation to me that's even worse? So let's look at what these people are about. Verse 6, it says that they are a, that they are a bitter and hasty nation. They seize other dwellings. Verse 7, they're dreaded and fearsome. They feel, they feel like they have justice and dignity, and, and they don't care. They don't really, it sounds like some of our political powers today. They have all the power, right? Number, verse 10, they scoff and laugh at kings and walled fortresses. 
They take over land, and they are their own god. That's how bad the, Chal- the Chaldeans in it are going to come, or the Babylonians, it's the same thing, used interchangeable. They're going to come, and they're going to bring justice to Judah, right? That's what the Lord tells Habakkuk. But notice in here, no, it, notice in here nowhere does he say that justice is, what time justice is going to come. And we have to remember that, too, as we go through our troubles. We bring things to the Lord. We keep bringing them to him. Lord, are you hearing me? Lord, are you doing this? I don't see what you're doing. And the Lord says, I'm working in your life, Ken. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to bring somebody else into your life. I'm going to bring a situation into your life. And that could be it. You know how the Lord works in you? Maybe he's going to make your life even more difficult for you to be able to look to turn to him and say, Lord, I don't know why you're doing this, but here you bring more difficulty in my life through this. So that's what Habakkuk is doing. That's what Habakkuk's complaint is. So <clears throat> have, you ever, have you ever wondered why the, uh, prosper, the, the evil continue to prosper? Right? It was just recently, my eyes have been kind of open to this more. And God doesn't bring judgment in your time frame. He brings it in his time frame right? So I have to think of myself, personally. If God brought immediate judgment on me, I wouldn't be standing here today. He would have taken me off the earth. If, if, if the Lord brought immediate judgment on me, I would have never gone down the path of sin in my life to me to understand his mercy, his grace, and his salvation, right? He would have brought immediate judgment on me. We have to thank the Lord that he lets us go and so it's not right for us to say, why, don't, why aren't you bringing judgment on that person right now? He didn't bring judgment on me right now. We have to understand that. The Lord's working in his life beyond our understanding. Right? So it's a principle that I'm still learning. For us to place, you know, Habakkuk is also forgetting a couple things about who God is. When it comes to us trusting in the Lord, we have to remember who God is. Right? Let's think about our God for a second and who he really is. Personal story. I didn't always trust my coworkers, right? I worked in a job that was dangerous, but I didn't always trust my coworkers, right? There were some I could, there were some I couldn't. And some of them did things that weren't ethical, right? They didn't do moral, they didn't perform their duties well, right? So I didn't always trust them. But when it comes to God, I can trust him. He's never disappointed me. God is faithful. You can trust him through all your circumstances that you're facing. So let's look at God for a second and who he is. God has the right and power to do what he desires to do in his time. That means he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants in his time. God is all-knowing, aware of the past. He's aware of your past. He's aware of the world's past, the present that you're in right now, and he's aware of the future, right? There are no surprises with God. He's omniscient, is what that means. And lastly, God always does what is right, what is right, at the right time, does what he should be done, does it consistently, without partiality, without prejudice. He is perfect in all his ways. He never ignores sin. All will be judged for their sin in his time. That means he is a righteous judge. All these things are foundational for us to be able to place our faith in him. We know God and who he is, that he is faithful. Honestly, none of these things. I'm I'm none of these things. I'm I'm not consistent. I don't view people without prejudice. Um, I'm not all-knowing. I don't ever think about the past. I don't think about the future. I think about where I'm at in this very moment. So our God is a living God. That's a true God. So let's look at Habakkuk's second complaint. He said all this, right? He complained, God, where are you? Are you hearing me? The Lord responds back, I hear you. Guess what? I know everything that's going on. And I'm going to send an evil nation that's more evil than the one you're dealing with, right? The second second complaint that that Habakkuk has is, God, why do you idly sit and look at the Chaldeans? Why do you idly sit at this evil nation that you're bringing? And you remain silent 
when the wicked swallow up the more righteous. So you're just going to sit and let them come in here and take care of business and bring the, the nation that I love, that I've been serving all these years, this kingdom, you're going to come and you're going to have this evil group come in and swallow them up. That's what he's trying to get at. So let's look at verse 12 for a second. And it says, so this is this complaint. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have adored them. You have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. So here's a back of keys agreeing with the Lord. He says, Lord, I get it. You are the rock. You know what's going on. You've ordained for this to happen. We're not going to die from this. But you're going to come in for reproof, and you're going to bring that nation in to bring reproof. Right? He admits that God has ordained judgment. In verse 14, we can look and see, and you shall, you made mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. So here Habakkuk goes to the next step. He says, Lord, you have made my people, Judah, like the fish of the sea. The fish of the sea being the lowest of lows, even though Matt and I enjoy them. All right, so here we are, the fish of the sea, the lowest of. And if we look at 15 through 17, when we look at 15 through 17, when he uses the word he, he's referring to the unrighteous. Right, so let's keep that in mind. He is the unrighteous. So let's look at 15 through 17 here. And it says, and he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them from his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices his net and makes offerings in his dragnet. For them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then a keeper on emptying his net and mer mercilessly killing nations forever? So what he's saying is, is the righteous are like the righteous are like fish. They're stuck in a net or they've been hooked. The evil ones, they catch them, they, they use them for sacrifices, for offering. They live a life of luxury by catching the righteous. They use them as food. Then they empty their nets and they go after more. That's what, Habakkuk, that's what Habakkuk is saying to him. So you're saying you made us the lowest of lows so you could hook us by the evil person. That is, that is Habakkuk's complaint. So let's look what our, 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 second, our next point of understanding is. Our next point of understanding is the righteous shall live by faith. So our first point that we had of understanding was we need to wait on the Lord for he is working in our lives beyond our understanding, right? Our second point is that the righteous shall live by faith. So let's look at, verse, let's look at chapter 2, verse 1 for a second. So this is how Habakkuk responds. It says, <clears throat> I will take my stand at my watchtower and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. And I will answer concerning my complaint. So here's Habakkuk saying, I'm going to go to my watchtower and I'm going to stand there and I'm going to wait for the Lord to come to me with his answer. I'm going to stand here and wait and I'm preparing my complaint back to him, my response back to him. That's what he sounds a little ticked off but I think he's doing it in humility and fear, but I'm going to go up there and say, Lord, all right, are you going to answer me? I'm here. I'm listening to what you have. Sometimes we don't listen to what the Lord wants to share with us. So the Lord's answer comes in verse 2 to him, and it says, it says, for still the wisdom waits. And the Lord said to me, write the vision and write it plain on the tablets so he may run who reads it. So he's saying to him, write it down in your journal, right? Write it down. I want you to take this, and I want you to write this down in your journal, right? And, I, and as Habakkuk did, he wrote it down in his journal. That's why we could get a chance to read that today. 
Write it down in your journal. I want you to stand by, and I want you to write it in a way that you could run with it. I want you to be able to take this somewhere. So, and be able to do it quickly. And I want you to write it down so we don't forget the vision that I've given to you. Prepare quickly and go, and share the prophecy, not to forget what you wrote. I think this sounds important. So let's see what the next thing is that he's going to share with us. If you don't forget anything, else, if you don't remind, if you don't remember anything in this whole book that we're sharing today, let's ver- let's look at verses two and three, for a second. And it says, "And the Lord answered me, and He said, Write the vision, as I said, plain on the tablet, so that you may be ready. For still the vision waits to a point of time; it hastens to the end; it will not lie, and it seems slow. Wait for it." We, it, when, t- when, the, when we don't hear the Lord answering it, it seems very slow to us, but wait for his answer. Verse 4, behold, his soul is puffed up. Remember, he is the evil one, the unrighteous. The unrighteous soul is puffed up and is not upright within him. Then it compares it to the righteous, and it says, but the righteous shall live by faith. So that's where it comes down to. Habakkuk, I want you to wait for me. Right? I want you to hear my message, but what I want you to write in your journal is to wait for me and to live by faith. That's what you, Habakkuk, I want you to have faith in me and who I am. And then it goes into verse 5, that the wealthy, essentially it says the wealthy, are living comfortable, but you know, they will be disappointed in their wealth. And it, and it uses the word wine there to indicate wealth. Moreover, the wealthy it's like a, the wine is like a traitor. Your wealth, your desire to take over things, the unrighteous, their day will come. It, it's, it, it ends. And the unrighteous continue to take people away as if, like death, it goes into. That's how aggressive some of the unrighteous are. Now, before you guys run out the back door and want to play in uh, Evesham Avenue in the traffic or jump off the Magnolia Bridge or whatever because I'm bringing so many heavy things to you here, Relax for a second, and let's hear what the Lord has to say next. So just as a little, so wait on the Lord, let him work, for he is coming. It is the Lord's timing. The unrighteous are puffed up, but the righteous shall live by faith. Do you feel sometimes in your life that you just can't carry on? Here's a verse of encouragement to you. Um, Hebrews 10, 36 through 39. And it says, for you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet in a little while, the coming one will come and will not be delayed. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Wow, this is a tremendous encouragement to me. We are reminded that the Lord is returning. No matter how bad life is right now, the Lord's coming back, right? He wants us to endure, and he wants us to have our faith, place our faith in him through it. He's not going to be delayed. His timing is absolutely perfect. The righteous shall live by faith. That's what he wants us to be, is the righteous to live by faith. We are not to be weak and be destroyed. That's not who we are as Christians. We are those who live by faith, and our souls are preserved. The Lord has you. I pick up Roger and take him to the men's group, and I always, I always ask Roger, Roger, how are you today? Roger, wait. And he always says, God has this. And he says, if not, we're in trouble. That's what he always says, so if you can hear Roger say that. Um, and it's so true. God has this. Verse, verse 5, right? Like we said, the wealthy, the wealthy, they betray him. The wealthy greed, they swallow him up. They swallow up like death. So we go into the five woes, right, as I mentioned earlier. The five woes, and we're going to look at those very quickly. We're just going to skim through those. But if we look, we're, look at um, chapter 2, verses um, 6 through 19. All right, so when we say the word woe, all right, I had to try to figure out, what do you mean by woe? It's essentially, in today's English, it would be, say, how terrible. How terrible is this? And so I call them the terribles, right? So, 
So again, when we're looking at him, we're talking about the unrighteous. So let me kind of put it into, uh, in today's English for you a little bit. So verse, verse 2, of, of, rather verse 6 of chapter 2 is the first well when it says, How terrible to the unrighteous who heaps up what is not his own for how long? So people continue to take advantage of those that are weak, the, unri- the righteous. The, Lord, the people of the world today just continue to. But you, what he's saying here is the Lord, this is the Lord speaking. He says, I'm going to judge them for that. No, remember we, lo- we learned that he is a righteous judge, one of the principles of God. It's not going to go ignored. Then we have verse 9. How terrible to the unrighteous who, greets evil, who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high. For people that take advantage of others to enhance themselves, to have larger homes, to have bigger bank accounts, to have more cars, to have their expensive trips. How terrible is that? The Lord is going to judge that. Verse 12, how terrible to the unrighteous who builds a town with blood and, and founds a city and iniquity. People aggressively take over people's property. How terrible is that? The Lord is going to judge that. Judge will, in, the, in verse 15, how terrible to the righteous who makes his neighbor drunk, right? Who pours out their wrath and makes him drunk. People take advantage of other, others by getting them intoxicated and, and how, have them sign agreements or this or that or take advantage of them sexually or all those other things. How terrible is that, right? But the Lord knows. And the number five, the woe number five is on verse 19. How terrible to the unrighteous who says a wooden, who says a wooden thing, who prays to a wooden thing, right? A person who prays to a wooden thing or says a wooden thing, awake. I want you to come awake. In the, in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, it talks many times about idols, how they're made with man. It's like me building this podium and, and worshiping it and saying, come alive, will you? Right? That's not who our God is. There's, hin- there's religions like Hinduism. Did you know there's like 5,000 Hindu um, missionaries that have come to the United States in the last few years? Blows my mind. Hinduism is growing strongly in this country. People are turning away from God. Remember we looked at people don't believe in God? No, they're turning to other religions right now. And as Christians, we say, well, why is that? You know, God's going to bring judgment on that. Woe to you. But let's, let's talk, get a little bit more personal. Where are we at with idols in our lives? Right? Does something stop you from worshiping him, to open his word every day, or to truly worship him? How, how about a sin in your life? I had to reckon with this. I was listening to John Piper one night, and he said to me, he pretty much talked to me, Ken, if there's anything that, if that sin is interfering with you and your relationship with God, that is your idol. That is your God. You've put that between me and worship. So I share with you the same thing that the Lord convicted me of. Is there something in your life that you have to say, I failed to worship you because there's something in my life that's preventing me from really getting to know you. If so, it's an idol in your life. God says, woe to you that we need to make sure our relationship with the Lord is right, that we don't have sin that's interfering with us in our relationship. So let's work at, look at verse 20 for a second. Chapter 2, verse 20. And it says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the, let the earth keep silent before him. This is a great verse. When you're going through trouble, the Lord is in his holy temple. He sits in his holy temple in peace. Right? Keep peace. Be silent around him. Be silent. The Lord's not all over the place pacing, wondering what's going to happen next. Psalms 33, 13, and 14 says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits. Enthroned, he looks out on all the heavens of the earth. It's just a reminder of peace. Remain in peace. The Lord is sitting, waiting.
All right, so we're going to go to chapter 3 now, and we're going to look at this, and we're going to bring um, to how this changes. So the first thing we looked at, wait on the Lord, live by faith. The next point of understanding is rejoice in God's salvation and his victories. So verses um, 1 through 15, the conversation that Habakkuk has and his journal changes from a conversation with God to prayer. He recognizes who God is, and he goes into a time of rejoicing and prayer. And as it says, the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, accounting his, accounting this according to whoever this is, all right? So he, he changes from to prayer time. I can picture Habakkuk falling on his knees, communicating with God, and God telling him to wait on me. I want you to live by faith. He falls onto his knees, and he goes into this prayer time. So let's look at what the things is that, that he recognizes. Verse 2, it says, it says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. He is saying, Lord, I, he I hear your message. I have your message. And I fear you. I respect you for who you are. So in the midst of your time, he's asking, will you be refreshed in me? Will I be able to understand you more? Please refresh with me who you are. But I'm listening. I'm on my knees in prayer. So he goes into several verses about who God is. And all these verses refer back to the Old Testament, things that have happened in the Old Testament. So if we look at verse 4, God controls the weather, right? Verse 6, God controls everything that happens in land. Verse 8, everything in the sea, God controls it. Verse 11, God controls the mountains. He made the mountains, it says. Verse 11, he makes the sun and the moon. He controls it. Verse 13 and 14, he controls the armies, all armies. He sits on his throne, and he looks at the world, and he's at peace with it. He is God. And then in verse 16, just brings a great closure to his, to his word here. And it says, verse 16, I hear, and my body trembles, and my lips quiver at the sound rottenness enters into my bones my legs tremble beneath me yes I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us so Habakkuk saying I'm here right my body is trembling I'm shaking it's as if my bones are rotted I can't even support my own weight I am so trembling over knowing that Judgment is going to come onto my people. But he knows that the Lord orchestrated this. This is the Lord's purpose for, his, for Judah to come. And he is walking in faith through this. And it goes into the greatest part of this whole book, verses 17 through 19. It says, Though the fig trees should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fall, and the field yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there will be no herd in the stalls. So Habakkuk is saying, even if there's no food, there's no food on the trees, there's no olives, there's no flock that's out in the field, there's no flock in the stalls, he said, then he goes into it in verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take my joy in the Lord of my salvation. So he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. You take everything from me. You take all my food. You take all my cattle. You take everything. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. That's what Habakkuk is saying. And then verse 19 says, God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Have you ever... It'll be a little bit like after I get done preaching here, like a weight off your shoulders. When, when something has happened in your life and the Lord provided for it, you feel like, you just feel so good. You feel so light. 
You just feel like a deer, right? You just feel relaxed. This is what Habakkuk is saying. Lord, I know that you have these plans. Wait, you want me to wait on you? I'll wait on you. You're working in my life more than I ever thought. You want me to trust in you, right? And last, you want me to rejoice in who you are and your salvation. I got a question for you. What do we do while we wait? Right? That's the hard part. What do we do while we wait? First of all, you're really plugged into the Lord. Do you really know Christ is your Savior? And your sin, we're talking about walk by faith. Have you, have you come to the point of knowing Christ is your Savior by faith? It's not what church you go to. It's not what you do. Not your works. But coming to know Christ is your Savior and truly placing your faith in him recognizing you have sin, that you're not plugged in to who God is, that you don't have his power. Do you know him as Savior? That's the most important thing. Next is, go to God in prayer. You have things that are going on in your life, go to God in prayer. Bring him your anxiety, your hurt, right, your anger, your disappointment, as Habakkuk did. You know, the Lord can take it. Come to him with it. Write it down. Write it down in your journal. Write down what the Lord is doing. Share your requests with others. And this is what Pastor Bill has been speaking on, right? You don't, go, you don't go through life alone. We need to share it with others. Ask others to share with you how God has worked in your life. Brian Jeffries last week, I said to him, what's, what's God doing in your life? And he shared with me, right? That was an encouragement to me, right? So that's what we should do. Ask others, what's God doing in your life? Read and study God's word, Right? You should be in God's word every day. If you're not in God's word every day, you're not plugged into him. Read about who he is. What's the characteristics of God? Learn how his love and mercy and his faithfulness is so true. If you're not reading God's word, you can't rely on that. You, can't, you don't know those things. So when the troubles come, you don't have that foundation to trust who he is. Remember and rejoice in what God has, that rejoice in what God has done. All of us, God has worked in all of our lives. Remember those things. Look back on the things of how he has been faithful to you through the years. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to them, to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall be exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our Lord is so faithful, you can trust him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Habakkuk and his, just his willingness to question you. I ask, Lord, that you would give us the courage to be able to read your word every day, to be able to understand these things that you have for us, that we could remember the characteristics of who you are, a mighty God. And Lord, we have people in this, in this church today that are hurting. We have things that are happening this week. I know doctor's appointments, people that are looking for cars or looking for jobs. And they are, they're distraught over things. They have anxiety. And I pray that you would work in their lives, that they would remember who you are, and that um, they could see how you're working in their lives. And Lord, thank you for working in our lives, even when we don't know what you're doing. We praise you for this. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you guys. Have a good day. Enjoy your Sunday. Thank you.